Welcome to the Tudor Dixon Podcast. I'm Tudor Dixon, and today I'm joined by Bobby Burrick, a writer for OutKick, based right here in the beautiful state of Michigan. Bobby reports and analyzes the latest media topics and trends, and his latest column caught my interest. I want to dive more into that today. Bobby, thank you so much for being here. Tudor, thanks for having me. Um, like I told you this last time, but it's so rare to talk to other people in media from Michigan. All of them seem to be based in L.A. or New York or Nashville. So, uh, yeah, I think you and I are the only ones that I know of. So it's pretty cool. I think it's great because we have the opportunity to kind of give that Midwest perspective yeah. and not a lot of people hear from folks in the Midwest. In your column this week was very interesting to me because not only are you talking about affirmative action, but you're talking about ESG. I think right. both of those things are that are things that affect the Midwest quite a bit. We have a lot of businesses here who feel like they're being crushed by the ESG, but we have a lot of awesome universities in Michigan, especially. And I want to get to what you're saying about affirmative action, because obviously we had this decision from the Supreme Court. It kind of made people go a little crazy on both sides. You have people on the right to defending it. You have people on the left saying that this is an atrocity, but you have kind of dug deep into this and said, is this really a good thing? I mean, uh, your numbers on Harvard were shocking to me. So I want you to kind of explain the background here. Yeah. When the ruling came out, I think it was a, or came down, I think it was on a Thursday or Friday and everybody rushed to judgment and the right loved it. The left hated it. And I didn't have an immediate opinion because those opinions don't carry that much weight. I mean, I always oppose the idea of affirmative action, but when I saw it, I said, okay, here's what I know about it, but I need to know a lot more about it to actually break it all down. So I spent 10 days researching it and digging through the numbers. And what I found was affirmative action is essentially what I call excused racism, and it enabled this movement. So the idea is in order to reach racial equality, we ought to racially discriminate against targeted groups. For affirmative action, the idea was if you racially discriminate against white people and Asians, it's going to make us a more equal society. So there's that element of it. But then the idea morphed into something much more than that. You mentioned ESG. The S in ESG stands for social, and a big part of it is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So as the BlackRock CEO mentioned in 2017, they invest based on ESG scores. So translation, ESG scores rank and score corporations based on how diverse they are. So the idea is hire less white people, hire more black people, and you will get a higher score. So again, the idea is to racially discriminate, but it's excused. It's excused racism. That hasn't made us a better society. This whole idea of fighting racism with planned and targeted racism, that's entirely backwards. Never before would that make any sense. But you look at what happened in the 1960s. The civil rights movement was coming to an end, and the Democrat Party introduced affirmative action to maintain control of racism all throughout institutions. So I found myself so alarmed that we're fighting racism with controlled racism, thus making us a more racist society. I always say we're not judged by who we are anymore. We're judged by our gender, sexual orientation, and skin color. So when you look at Ron, you say, Ron, who's a straight white male. That didn't happen before, and it shouldn't happen now. It's wrong. It's backwards. And we're a more racist society because of it. Well, I think one of the things that shocked me the most was the conversation in there or the the part that you put in there about LinkedIn, Yeah, because I think a lot of people that I know use LinkedIn and a lot of my friends who are white are using LinkedIn to look for jobs. But LinkedIn can actually they can actually sort you by race when they're looking for people to fill their positions. Th that seems illegal to me. But why? Why is that allowed? Yeah, so the Daily uh, Wire first reported this, and um, LinkedIn essentially admitted it, calling it diversity. Um, so the idea is recruiters can search for candidates by race. So like I say in the piece, if you're white, you can rest assured 
you're not showing up in the database and you're missing out on that lucrative job in the name of diversity. I mean, but that should be that go either way too. I mean, if you had a company that really truly had a problem with racism, I mean, aren't you, aren't you in a situation where you could either be promoting it on either side? I mean, shouldn't we just not be doing this at all? Yeah, I think you definitely, I mean, you're right. It shouldn't happen either way. I mean, based on the way LinkedIn describes it they say it's for diversity meaning less white people but if there was just a racist ceo that only yeah, wanted could white totally people, abuse it too yeah they absolutely could or they could say no females or no trans people or right. no gay people they could do it however they want so that just goes back to my premise we shouldn't be discriminating against anybody racially white black hispanic asian biracial it shouldn't happen so what we have here now is this controlled racism where you're allowed to discriminate in the name of equity diversity it shouldn't happen at all when the civil rights movement near the end the idea was to take racism out of all this to the pivot towards a colorblind society through affirmative action ESG, equity, LinkedIn. This is not a colorblind society. It's a more racialized society. Well, I mean, we are told every single day that the Biden administration has to hire people based on the boxes that they check. I mean, if you look at even during his race, during his race for president, he was out there. He had a short list of, I think, five or six women. And one of them was Gretchen Whitmer, who is the governor of Michigan. One of them was Kamala Harris. And our understanding, what we learned when we were doing our opposition research in the state of Michigan against Gretchen Whitmer was her team was actually looking for property in Washington, D.C., because they were promised she was the person that Joe Biden looked at her when they met in Delaware and said, you're my gal. You're going to fill that. You're you're checking that box of a female on my ticket. And then his team came in and said, no, 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 sir. She doesn't check all the boxes. We've got to have a woman who checks the racial box as well. And she didn't get that. And we have Kamala Harris. And I think that a lot of people have been horrified by the fact that this is a person who can't even have a conversation, let alone with the media, but world leaders. I mean, she has been a complete embarrassment. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, the worst vice president. Um, I mean, I think she's worse than Joe Biden was for Obama. I don't think it's particularly close. I mean, as far as Biden isn't, wasn't as bad then as he was now. But it, it comes for full circle because this idea of equity, which is what they called it when he picked Kamala Harris, is these ideas have raised a profile of certain African Americans, but at the same time, they've dis they've diminished regular average day African Americans. Joy Reid said this accidentally, but according to herself, she would have qualified for Harvard either way, but she was recruited because they wanted a mm -hmm. black student, but her test scores were higher than most white and Asian students, is what she says. So when she got there, she said the white students undermined her and whispered behind her ears, oh, she's just here because she's black. Well, I don't know if that's true because I don't really trust Joy Reid, but most certainly that has happened to other qualified black students. And you see it all the time in the media too, when there is a qualified black person who rises up, there's skepticism because these networks have pushed so long, oh, we're all about diversity. Like Disney CEO Bob Iger has said, diversity is priority number one. So that undermines the black and Hispanic um, employees that rise up the rank at like ABC News. So that overall, that hasn't benefited that many black students. Moreover, this is according to, uh, I believe it was the Rolling Stone. This was a fascinating study. B black students who are admitted into college affirmatively have a one to two ratio higher of dropping out because they're being mm -hmm. put into a college they weren't qualified to be put in versus if they attended a college where they did. So affirmative action has actually increased dropout rates among black and Hispanic students drastically. But nobody in the press talks about that. They just honor the likes of like Kamala Harris and Joy Reid, who they made avatars for the system. It's really all a sham where very few people have actually benefited from affirmative action. But do you think that there were barriers broken with affirmative affirmative action? Because when this went into, I mean, what, this started in the 60s, yeah. was it? So yeah. in the 60s, I mean, it probably, there probably were f m fewer 
black faces in big corporations. And this probably did open doors that otherwise would not have been because the country was a much different place then. But I think what people, and you can argue with me on that, but I, I, I believe that there was a place for it and it opened those doors and those doors have stayed open. I don't think that the country is reversing on that. And I think that's why people feel like now, hey, wait a minute, we don't need to be told all the time that we need diversity. We are welcoming everybody but maybe I'm wrong. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think what you described is a policy that should have had an expiration date. But what mm -hmm. happens now is we're at the point of overcorrection because a lot of times and this happens all throughout society. We diagnose a problem, fix it, but it just keeps on escalating from there. It's very similar to what's happening with the LGBT community. So mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, most of America agreed that gay marriage should be legalized. And once it was, the LGBT activists didn't just stop and cherish the win. They had to keep on escalating. They had to keep on progressing. And now you have fights to normalize gender ideology and gender affirming care. So you take a problem, you fix the problem, but you can't take the win. You have to keep on moving forward. And that's what we've seen with race too. Um, you're right. There was a time in history where black people were held back, but that problem has been fixed. It's been fixed a long time ago. So to say it's not, you're either denying progress or lying, grandstanding, or maybe you are trying to reverse it and punish the people for the sins or the perceived privileges of their ancestors. So all of this stuff should have an expiration date once it's fixed. In affirmative action, the civil rights movement in the late 60s and early 70s mostly fixed that problem. So for this to go on all this time, and you mentioned that Harvard study, now where Asians only have about a 12% chance of admission, the top academic decal, where Black students have a 56% chance, that is overcorrecting denying progress and refusing to do away with a policy that's no longer justified in this day and age. Well, and I think that's something that we need to remind people of that one of the groups that said we want this to stop are the Asian students who came forward and said, wait a minute, all of a sudden we're working our tails off to get into these prestigious universities and we're being held back for someone who maybe has not worked as hard as we have, maybe have not received the grades that we've received. And that's devastating. I mean, I think this goes along with even when you see these young women who have worked so hard in their sport and suddenly that it's like, oh no, you have to accept that a man is going to be in your sport now. I mean, the things are not that different. However, the left is very good at making, at demonizing people who go against these things. So I think that you're right. There was a time and a place and this should have had an expiration date, but now it's a really hard thing to come out and talk about because if you are a white American and you come out and say, well, wait a minute, I think that we're past this. Certainly the left is going to come after you and say, oh, do you think that because you're a racist and it's an effective argument? I think that no matter what you say on this, I mean, it's very similar to LGBTQ rights. You see this, um, I would say, in the presidential race right now, where I think that people on the right have tried to go so far against this that we have lost ground that w was basic. And now it does come off as well, the right has started to become look started to look like they're discriminating because there's been such a radical push in one direction that if you push back at all, you can get caught up in pushing far too far. I mean, we saw that with the DeSantis campaign. What you described is the issue why the right is always losing the culture war and a lot of times mm -hmm. losing public perception. The left controls the messaging so they control the outrage, so they control the fear, right? If you control the messaging, you control the outrage and you control the fear. So what the left has done so well, be it with gender or race, is that they can label you a racist, a transphobe, a homophobe, a bigot. Those terms are so, those terms are so effective that it's made people not not allow themselves to be censored, but self-censor. I wrote a column a couple of weeks ago about coming out of the closet against trans ideology. I dug into some numbers. I mean, they were wild, so revealing. 70% of Americans believe biological men should not be participating in female sports. About 60% of the country agree the trans movement has gone too far, that it's infested schools, infested everyday lives of people who aren't involved. 
But so few people are willing to say that publicly. So what you have here is the majority of the country agrees, but they're self-censoring. So the minority of the country is controlling the perception. So those 30% that believe men and women should play in the same sports teams, they're controlling about 90% of the conversation, or the 70% who disagree only are represented by about 10% of people in the media. So that shifts to perception to say, this is right, this is wrong, and it creates fear because you believe that you're in the minority, that you're wrong, mm -hmm. but you're not. If you don't agree that children should be going under the knife and getting these surgeries, you might feel, well, if I speak up, I'm going to be alone. No, no, you can come out because most people agree with you. They're just so afraid to say it. The same thing with race, Tudor. I believe most Americans know that the BLM riots in 2020 went too far and this whole idea about promoting people based on their skin color. They know it's wrong, but they're afraid to be called racist and ruin their own career that they shut up and self-censor. That's the biggest problem. If you ask me, why is this happening? The answer is always the same because of fear. People self-censor and stay quiet out of fear. Well, let, let's talk about ESG for a second, because I would argue that the Democrats are effective at segregating the country. And that is a problem when you come when it comes to both factions of society trying to start their own businesses, because Democrats are keeping our minority communities in a situation where I mean, we just uh, we just read a story that in Chicago public schools, I think there's dozens of them that are not even meeting, they are at 0% reading and math e efficiency. I mean, think of proficiency. I mean, think about that 0%. These kids are learning nothing, essentially. They don't have enough kids to actually stay open and yet we're paying to keep these schools open. But these are minority communities. So what is the opportunity in life for these students? They will be lifelong Democrat voters because they will be con convinced that that's the way they it has to be. But they will stay segregated because they will not be able to achieve to go out and build their own businesses to build their own, you know, join in communities that are successful because they've been kept down by policies that have been driven by the Democrats to keep people in a situation where they are not getting the opportunity that they should have. And then you you go into these rural communities where mom and pop, they've created a company, it's growing, they want to see investment in it. But there is no diversity in that community because Democrats have essentially kept those people who would be coming into these communities and providing diversity in a situation where they can't read or write. I mean, this is a pretty twisted situation we have in the United States. Yeah. And I think a lot about all this and I really don't want to lose perspective. So I try to challenge myself. But I come to the same conclusion over and over again. The same group benefits from all of this stuff and is the mm. Democrat Party. We were told during COVID, we were just trying to protect the vulnerable. Well, who was the biggest winner in COVID? The Democrats, by far. Who, who was the biggest winner in the racial reckoning? The Democrats who framed their oppositions as racist and were able to gain control over society. I fear the same things happening with the transgender movement. The trans people are not benefiting from this. They're gonna, a lot of them are going to look back and say, why did I get this surgery? Why am I suffering from mm -hmm. this lifetime worth of pain? But it's the people in power who benefit because they hold themselves up as heroes for pretending to support a marginalized group and they vilify their opposition. All throughout history, one thing has remained, the people in power governing govern to stay in power and they create division amongst their subordinates and their opponents so they can't rise together and challenge them. It's the old adage, um, a country divided cannot unify in opposition against those in control. That is so true about everything that's happening right now. Every policy is to keep those people in power and actually gain power and to depower everybody else. I don't believe any of this stuff that they're trying to rise up and help marginalize groups. None of that is true. They're trying to remain in power and they're doing so quite effectively. Um, I had a study in my column, uh, race relations in America have suffered greatly since Joe Biden's took, taken office. Why? Because every time he goes to an HBCU or goes on TV, he says white supremacy is the greatest yeah. threat to the homeland. Well, mm -hmm. people begin to believe that. They begin to believe that 
their neighbors who are different color are owed something or that they're racist or that they deserve to be punished for the sins of people who look like them. This messaging is effective, but it's not helping society. It's only making us more hateful, divisive, and divided. Well, if I look at the state of Michigan in Detroit, the overregulation is so extreme. And this is, there's state overregulation, but there's also overregulation in just the city of Detroit that is run by Democrats. And so the idea of being able to come out of poverty, start your own business, build yourself up, it's almost impossible in these areas. And I look at that and I think, how is it that in this state, people are holding up these folks who are actually holding everyone back in the state of Michigan. And really a lot of people will say, oh, you're from Michigan, you must be from Detroit <laughs> because that's the, the city that they know in Michigan, right? But rarely do you ever hear someone go, oh, where are you going for spring break? We're going to Detroit. You know, we'll hear people say they're going to Chicago, but Detroit is not like the place that people are vacationing these days because it is so destroyed. And it is really because of these policies that are holding people back. Yeah, you're so right. Whenever people ask, whenever people ask me, where are you from? I'll mention like Port Huron or Sandusky, Michigan. They're like, where, where? We never heard of that. So I say, oh, two hours from Detroit. Oh, okay. We get what you're saying. It is so unfortunate that people don't want to vacation and travel to Detroit. I mean, I get it. I was just there a couple of weekends ago. It's not very nice, but it should be a beautiful place. I mean, the casinos, um, I mean, it's not too far from the water. You go out to the suburbs. It should be a beautiful area that people want to, but it's not. And so much of that has to do with policy and those people in charge. And it really is unfortunate. Um, you saw it during the pandemic, uh, New York and California got the worst reps. What about Michigan? People weren't coming to Michigan during the pandemic. They were leaving Michigan. They were discouraged of Michigan. And it's for those very reasons. And um, yeah, I, I, uh, I just get so frustrated because all these people who appear on the TV screen who say that they're working for the people, it's such a lie. They're working for themselves. And that's been so obvious whenever we discuss any of these topics. Wouldn't it be better for young black students to be getting the attention in from kindergarten to 12th grade to be learning in those grades so that they can then be getting scholarships to universities that universities are looking at them because gosh they've got they've had such a great education and yet somehow that is not the focus of democrats they i mean in michigan right now the big talk is we're going to make sure that kids have meals every kid in the state of michigan will have a free breakfast and a free lunch and we're like i mean that's fantastic but what are you doing to make sure they actually can read and, and do math yeah. Um, about a month ago, I was chatting with a friend and she has a niece who's um, 13 years old, um, young black girl. And um, she was speaking to her aunt, who's my friend. And she was like, you know, am I going to am I going to be admitted to college through affirmative action or, you know, is are these programs going to help me? Am I going to have an easier time? And the aunt said she was so frustrated because that's the message that young black kids get now. How do I how can I take advantage of this system that everybody's telling me that I'm owed. That, that shouldn't be the goal. That shouldn't be the dream. The dream should be to get as good education as you can, be as smart as you can, and ride your own wave of success, not ride a system. But you see it all the time. You go on TikTok, which so many young people are on right now. A lot of influencers are talking about just that, diversity, what the country's owed, separating people into oppressors, in the oppressed, none of this is good. None of this making us a better, less racialized society. And you're so right. Like young black kids, they shouldn't be thinking about what they're owed. They're, they should be thinking about how to better themselves at such a young age. And the message has totally changed. What is that mentality? It's the victim mentality. Those in charge are telling us that the, the easiest way to success in 2023 is to be a victim. And if you're not a victim, you're going to you're going to face challenges. Um, that was not the message when I was growing up. And that wasn't the message when a lot of people were growing up. So if that's the idea now to find a way to be a victim. We're in for a long haul to be able to get society back to a place where our skills, our knowledge define who we are, because right now identity trumps all else. 
Well, but again, I will say that I think that conservatives are doing a terrible job in this area because, first of all, we don't have influencers in that space. We don't have influencers talking about, you know, you have value. Getting married has value. Making sure that you take care of your body has value, that you are, there's something important about you. You have gifts. You need to find your own gifts. But our messengers that we do have, I believe, take it to an extreme. It's, especially for young women, the messages that I hear out of the conservative side are you only have value if you're married and get married young and stay, put your career on hold, have kids right away, focus on that. That's, you can't do both. And you know, that is, that's going to drive women away. I mean, that, that isn't my story. I got married, but I didn't have kids for many years. I had a career for many years before I had children. And now I have a career and children. And so why is it that it seems that on our side, we lift voices up that are so far to the right that end up becoming like, I mean, it's like we're going back to the fifties and that's just not going to win young people over. So are we doing this wrong without showing people how, how great life can be if you are focused on family and goals? I mean, it has to be, you have to be focused on family the way we tell you to be. That seems to be screwing us up as well. Yeah. And that goes back to the first topic here about how the right is losing the war of messaging, which is really the most important war and battle going on right now. And you bring up a good point. A lot of times conservative influencers are telling women, get married, have a bunch of kids, stay at home, don't work. Where the left is telling them, hey, you know, go be independent, go get a job, go get education, go make a lot of money. Well, some of that's dishonest, but I think for most 16, 17, 18 year old girls who are getting ready to vote or get more into society and understanding politics, of course, they're going to side with the left's message, at least by and large, because I don't think a lot of 16, 17 year old girls want to sign up for a life of just being married, having a bunch of kids and not working. Some do, and that's fine. But I think you're right. The messaging on the right is not very strong. It goes back to maybe the influencers, maybe we're lifting up and promulgating the wrong influencers. But when somebody writes the book on the culture war, the first check has to go to left because they've controlled and manipulated the messaging far better than their opposition, which is failing. They're failing on every topic. I think a lot of times they failed during COVID. Sometimes they came across too conspiratorial, too resentful, too um, agitated. That's not how you win this. And um, hopefully over time they realize that because the left is gaining more and more ground culturally because of that message. Yeah, it's a tough situation for conservatives. We see them, they have gone younger and younger. They've influenced younger and younger people. And I believe that the left understands, hey, if we get the kids, the kids will push back on the parents and eventually the parents will either conform or the kids will tell them we're out, you know? And so, I mean, we've seen this in other countries where they go after the youngest group and that's effective, but also there's this disruption in the country because you've got kids against parents. And, and that sadly is effective when you are shaming people into going out and voting. We had something interesting happen in Michigan, and I don't know where this rule came from because I've been told by legislators this is not a law. And I'm trying to research, did this come from HHS? Where is this coming from? But again, I got an email yesterday saying, your daughter will turn 12 this year, and therefore you will no longer have access to her medical records. She can sign you over as medical proxy, but you will have limited access to her medical records because her medical records are now for her to see and not for you at 12. What does that mean when you have the government saying, you are out of your child's medical records at 12 years old. How can she be making decisions with her doctor without me present? Yeah, that that's disgusting and it's concerning. And um, I mean, on a somewhat lighter note, um, my, my friend Lisa Booth, I just did a podcast with her. She always brings up this point that I always remember when it comes to these issues. When she was 14 years old, she got a belly button ring and regretted it immediately. But the point of the story is, is that when you're young, you can't decide if you should get your belly button pierced, 
go to right. a date with somebody, hang out with a new friend. Like you're so indecisive and emotionally inconsistent that the very worst thing you can do is have control of your own medical decisions because your your brain's not formed and capable enough at that point to make a decision. So you're right. A 12 year old is hardly capable of deciding if they want a PlayStation or an Xbox, but to make medical decisions against their parents' wishes, that goes back to what we've lost. And that is common sense. You go back 15 years ago and tell somebody that they would say, no way could that happen in this America. 12 years right. old, they don't have to ask their parents to make these medical decisions, but apparently we're there now. So you have to, have to ask yourself, how did we spiral so far out of control that this is now a reality? And the crazy thing is that when you ask people, they all go, yeah, I have no idea. I didn't know. I mean, legislators, I had no idea. I don't know where that came from. And I think, how is this it's happening? Wild. And oftentimes, in Michigan, I don't know if this is happening in other states, but I would tell you to be aware that at least in Michigan, agencies are formed and agencies somehow can create law. I mean, the DNR, they can go after you. You get a misdemeanor if you're not wearing hunter's orange. And then if you get a misdemeanor, you can no longer have concealed carry. And so all of these things somehow are connected. But how does a, an organization like that, that does not make law, create a rule that can cause you to be considered breaking the law? These are the things that I don't think that the average public is tuned into or knows how to fight back on. And it seems like government gets bigger and bigger. We just saw that Governor Whitmer created a second, essentially a second Department of Ed in the the state of Michigan. She doesn't have control. The Department of Ed in the state of Michigan, the State Department, is separate from the governor's office. So now she has one that reports to her and the main one. But ultimately, if we look at how Democrats have treated education, Big Ed has not really helped us. Yeah. I mean, again, more it's, it's about power, right? She's trying to gain more unilateral power. And we're just hearing that about the 12-year-old doesn't surprise me. Um, I hadn't heard about it, but makes total sense given the trajectory we've gone but those are the kind i'll send you the email and then yeah. you can do all the research for me <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely i might even write about it because it's just awful but those are the conversations we should be having those are the conversations that should be on the nightly news on cable news on radio but it's not the conversations right. we're having in the media are so useless and such a distraction like some of the stuff about chris christie who's on leading every news show now i mean it's just a complete waste of time like him talking about trump calling himself fat that, that who cares that, that doesn't affect anybody that shouldn't be the lead news story of cable news it should be conversations like that particularly on local news a detroit news station should be covering that Th those topics the topics that affect households dinner tables that's what needs to be highlighted not the inner workings of dc that a lot of people don't really care about and are not affected by so it's frustrating to me how poorly our news has done as a whole to bring attention to the stories that actually matter. Well, I would argue that in general, our side has has been more emotional than we have been. I mean, historically, Republicans had been fact driven. And I think they said, oh, well, that's not working. But when we tried to take the emotional side of things, we're a little too emotional about it. And so I, I do think that there is the opportunity for us to, with folks like you out there in the media with OutKick, honestly, out there in the media, there is an opportunity to fight back. We haven't had that either. We haven't really had a space in the media. I mean, there's a few spaces in the media, but there haven't been reporters like yourself who are out there saying, well, let me dig into this. And what I think is key for people who are listening today is that you said, I took 10 days to go, do I know enough about this to talk about it? Should I research this, this affirmative action, how it connects to ESG? And to me, that's incredibly important that you have somebody who's willing to take the time. I think that's another thing. We're too quick to jump on a story and react and react with emotion. But I appreciate the fact that you were able to step back, do some research and bring it to us. Tell everybody where they can find your writing, because I think what you do is so important. I really appreciate that. I just went real quick. When I became a journalist, or some people say I'm not, some people say whatever, but my most important thing for me was to hold the people in power accountable and ask the questions that nobody else is asking. And just, there's not enough people doing that. So it's so important for me to sit back and look at an issue and hold the people in charge 
accountable and make them answer questions and at least reveal the questions that are not being asked. So that's point number one. But yeah, anyone who can find me, um, I'm on Twitter, um, outkick.com, at Twitter, at Burak, Bobby underscore my handle is kind of wonky, but I apparently can't change it. And uh, yeah, I go to different podcasts and radio shows and TV shows throughout the week and uh, really appreciate you having me on. I always enjoy coming on with you and uh, seeing your success as a podcaster. I see you all over TV now. So very cool. Well, thank you so much. Definitely check out Bobby Burrick. He is doing great stuff. Really, I love everything that you're putting out there. And it's important for people to follow folks like you so they know what's going on. Thank you for being on today. And thank you all for joining us as usual on the Tudor Dixon podcast. And for this episode and others, you can check out TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there or head over to the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure you join us next time on the Tudor Dixon podcast. Have an awesome week.